Ladies and gentlemen, most welcome to this symposium on probiotics in pediatrics, facts, fiction and future. I will start off with the introduction and tell you, just to give you a broad reminder that we are talking about the, our borders towards the environment, that 99% of, of this is, are the course the mucosa, and it's the size of an, of an international tennis court. But it is a very complex ecosystem, and this is symbolized here, where you can see, I mean, symbolizing by the Alp Valley, and, and the, it's a complex ecosystem that comprises 10 times as many cells as there are cells in the body, the bacteria. There are more than 500 species, out of which more than 50% of the strains are unknown and each of them had numerous strains within the species. It's like, this is like looking into a jungle when you're saying that, well, we have one species, that's mammals, and then there are many strains of them, various different mammals. We have another species which are insects, and we have many different insects. But the point here is that it's surprisingly stable once it is established. The other aspect is, when we are talking probiotics, is, of course, that to believe that you, with one single strain, would affect this enormously complex ecosystem is rather naive. Now then comes the immunologically mediated diseases of affluence. That there is an increase on a log scale proportional increase which is similar for Crohn's disease in the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and allergic diseases. And as a matter of fact, in many countries, you can superimpose more or less these curves on each other on a proportional level. Everybody is talking about allergies, and which is usually my field and which is my field of uh, expertise. But in this audience, you also know that the inflammatory bowel diseases are increasing, but and actually at a similar level. And it's also in the affluent societies with an affluent lifestyle. And it also started basically in among the affluent segments of a population. So these are the immunologically mediated diseases of affluence that you overreact to totally innocent, cuddly cats and dogs and innocuous pollens. We call it allergies. You overreact to something in the gut content, which most of us do not, which I would call normal gut content. Or, worst of all, you overreact to yourself. And all these are increasing in a similar level. The next step I want to set as a setting of the stage is that the gut microbiota are essential for the postnatal maturation of the immune system. They are actually the major driving force for the major development of immune regulation. And this is why our team started to go into the microbes when we were doing our studies in, in, in Eastern Europe and, and comparing it with Scandinavia 20 years ago, where we opened it, because it's well known for every pediatric immunologist that the gut microbiota are crucial for the development of immune, regular, immune system. And, of course, which most of you would know in this audience, but I have to point out in an allergic or allergy conference audience, that it is a prerequisite for the development of oral tolerance. Germ-free animals do not develop oral tolerance. <laughs> so what we have is that we are looking for Th1 and a Th2 type balance. Now then, on allergy congresses, I can spend half an hour discussing the immune regulation, why this is bad, the Th2. However, having a Th2 overweight is a wet dream on, an immunolo on the diabetes congress, because they hate to see this. Because the bottom line seems to be that, that we get a normal regulatory T cell system. And this is where the gut microbiota come in. Come in. And this is also the definition for the probiotics, so we are sure we are talking about the same things. They are live, and they are by definition they are requested to be live. And, and they should have some sort of health benefit to the host. And again, if I come back to from my point of view, which is the ecology point of view, which is not necessarily the one that is the correct one eventually, is that if we look on this intestinal ecosystem with the microbes, the diet, the host, which is obviously clear, and this is when it goes wrong, you get various infections, and you can, get, you can screw it up for different reasons, 
And then, of course, comes various other aspects which all upset this intestinal ecosystem, a black box of which we know very little right now. And this has consequences of various sorts, as you know. And this is where some of us believe that probiotics have an effect, that there are only a few, a limited number of strains that are documented clinically. When I this talk about probiotics and our discussion today is those strains where they have a clinical documentation that meets adequate criteria. There is no question that in the lactobacillus family and those that I'm mentioning in uh, putting up here have a clinical documentation. Not, I'm, I'm not too interested in uh, epithelial cell reactions and that sort of thing. I'm interested in the clinical stuff. Do they work in a clinical situation or not? That is the primary question, not what happens in a, in a, in a cell culture. And so there is no question of that. There is also one of the bifidus strains uh, that have, have, have an adequate documentation. While these others one have are lacking proper documentation. Mind you, I am not saying that they are not working. I'm saying that there is more research needed to support them. So the conclusions for those who fell asleep while I was talking is that the microbiome is very complex that microbes are essential for the development of immune regulation, and that infancy is a critical period.